All right. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, we'll get going here. Today's topic is um, financial metrics with tech portfolio management. Now, I've intentionally given that kind of a vague title, but I'm going to break down some other jargon and terms that you might recognize as being relevant or adjacent to what we're going to talk about today. Um, my name is Chris. Um, I am basically an enterprise agility advocate, uh, a coach, um, an emergent tech educator. And uh, today's topic is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, now, the last run of webinars that we've been doing together, Laura, have been related to generative AI. Uh, another one of my favorite topics, probably um, a, a tie, I'd say. But why do I like this topic? I was asking myself this while, while I was uh, preparing the presentation here. Um, and it occurred to me that I, you know, I must be a really a glutton for punishment because this is a very tough topic. Um, but I think the reason I like it so much is for one thing, it's a big systems thinking topic. And I love systems thinking. And I'd like to see more systems thinking used for practical benefit in organizations. And I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit to be had there. And so I, I like that. I think I like the idea of potential. Uh, and I like the idea of some very tangible frameworks that can be implemented to allow us to make progress with something like this. Um, the other reason I like this is because it's in my mind, it really is where the rubber hits the road on uh, realizing the ultimate enterprise value of agility. Um, or if you don't want to call it agile or you don't want to call it agility, you can call it something else. And there's all kinds of things that you can call it. But if you don't get too hung up on terminology and you think about what is agile all about, what are the principles of agile, um, what are the priorities and the values that we want to see in an Agile practice on Agile teams? Those things are great, but they are all there to deliver business value. And ultimately, business value has to be measured in dollars. And all too often, we see that the, the principles of agility and the work processes, the ceremonies, um, the training, the certification ecosystem, all this stuff that has grown up around agility um, there are a lot of good ideas there, but if you cannot take those ideas full circle through implementation and at scale and stitch together all those agile teams and all those arts and all those user stories and all those practices and all those ceremonies, if you can't orchestrate that all into at scale business value measured with money, then what are we doing? And so I think that's why I like it, because at the end of the day, it's about honesty when we're talking about value. OK, I'll get off my soapbox and, and keep going here. All right. So today is a quick agenda is what we're going to cover. And I probably, as usual, probably try to cram too much content into this webinar. And if so, I apologize in advance. I would just ask you guys, feel free to hit up the chat. Um, you know, I would love for this to be a conversation. I always have more to learn. I'm just here to share my perspective, what I've seen in the organizations that I've worked with and to share a little bit about the trends I see and the tools I see. But the purpose is not really to prescribe anything. <laughs> um, there are no silver bullets in an area like this. There are no prescriptions that can be followed step by step. These things are frameworks. There are lots of toolboxes, but ultimately it's up to you to apply the tools that you need at the right time to engage the people that you need at the right time and to figure out how to solve your own problems. In a webinar, I'm not going to solve your challenges for you, right? But if I can leave you with your wheels spinning and thinking about what's possible here and seeing the potential of improved ways of measuring things, improved ways of scaling agile practices, um, improved ways of delivering business value, uh, and maybe improving people's lives along the way a little bit in terms of our employee engagement and our, our workplace culture, to me, that's a big win. So that's that's my goal, all right? My goal is not to solve any specific problems. So I'm going to start with some terms. I think level setting on some of those terms would be helpful. 
We're going to talk, obviously, about financial data and integration of IT data, aggregating these bodies of data together so that we can achieve meaningful measurement around IT investments, cloud spend, um, software and agile project expenditures, things like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about LPM. Uh, LPM is Lean Portfolio Management. Talk a little bit more about that uh, along with the other terms. Um, kind of woven throughout here is going to be the idea of incremental funding and dy dynamic budgeting. And I'll tell you right away, that's basically a different approach to funding and budgeting than the annual budget cycle. Um, and if you want to, I'd love to hear in the chat who here operates under an annual budget cycle model. Um, do we deal with approvals every year, um, OKRs and KPIs that are then tied to whatever got approved? We go, we ask for money, managers approve that stuff, finance writes the checks, and then that's our bucket of money for the year. And we have essentially our spend and our approved dollars for an entire year, and that's the cycle. Now, I can tell you, a cycle time of a year is a long cycle time. And if you think about agile cycles and the principles of agility, the principles of lean, a core fundamental here is to always be shrinking the cycles. If when you shrink the cycles, you can adapt faster, you can pivot faster. Um, one of the main things about reducing cycle times is you're reducing risk. If things go off the rails and you blow it on an annual budget, then you've blown a lot of money and a lot of time. That's really expensive, really big risk. But if you blow it on a shorter time frame, then you've blown less money, you've blown less time, you can course correct, you know, maybe even come out ahead for the year. But that requires a shortened cycle time. So you're driving down risk. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then finally, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of shared metrics for IT and finance to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's get into it. I'll check the chat real quick. Um, I see some comments. Um, yep. Janice says uh, we use annual funding for persistent teams based on traditional run rates and projected KPIs and the portfolio but look to adjust on a quarterly basis. So that's step in the right direction, right? Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so a few main things here. Um, it's 2024, things are crazy. It's a VUCA world, things are volatile, uncertain. Uh, change is happening all the time. Um, we have to be adaptive. We have to have management mechanisms and formalized processes and governance in place that seemingly counterintuitively enables distributed power, distributed decision making so that we can move quickly, uh, so that we have flexibility, so that we can adapt when things change and they always change. Um, at the same time, we have this other side of the coin in which we have these super gnarly, really expensive software and IT systems um, that are business critical. You know, we can't get away from those. We can't escape VUCA on the one hand, and we can't escape large, gnarly enterprise software and technology systems on the other hand. So we have to figure out how to reconcile these things somehow. Um, and then there are very real financial implications. If we um, if we spend on the wrong thing, if we invest in the wrong software or tech product, um, then uh, that's expensive. The talent is expensive. The the uh, the overhead is expensive. The tools and the tech are expensive. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opex uh, associated with this stuff. So if we are not making the right investments in the right products and in the right work streams then obviously there's huge, uh, huge financial liability there. Um, so how do we, how do we um, make some progress here, <laughs> right? So basically the, the thrust of the rest of this talk is that the key to progress here um, is first and foremost, it's about data and it's about shared data. And um, this is not theory. I've seen this in practice and I've dealt with a lot of uh, a lot of customers, a lot of partners and vendors, um, as well as some sort of, sort of digital transformation partners who deal exclusively just with this financial transformation zone. It's really interesting, but I can tell you, it always comes back to the data um, and, uh, and then what you do with the data. And it comes down to sharing the data and being able to visualize it in ways that different stakeholders who often are siloed. And in this case, we're talking basically finance and IT 
Um, but you can also have silos around IT and the business, um, IT and product. Finance is sometimes siloed from everybody just with their only communication vehicle being these long budgeting cycles. So very inefficient um, and very little visibility, very little opportunity for feedback loops and lessons learned and adjustments. And that's what we need if we're going to um, be able to deliver consistent business value that's in line with what's really going on. So, um, but just that's, that's really kind of the, the main thing here is that, uh, um, all of the things I'm about to share are underpinned by data and rapid real time sharing of these data flows. Um, and so there's obviously, there's an engineering component there. Uh, you know, there's an infrastructure component, there's a big data visualization component. But there's a process and a, and a culture component as well. And, uh, um, you know, if your culture is remaining siloed and there's not collaboration there and, you know, there's not a bit of a willingness to experiment and, you know, there are all the agile things, right? All of the things that we're always talking about in a variety of subject matter, they all apply here as well. Um, and uh, so without the right collaborative and cultural aspects here, then none of this is going to work, even if you have all the tooling and the tech figured out. Um, second slide of main things here. These are just, you know, I figure, you know, you could we could end right now. And these four things are, are things to take away, right? Um, if you are trying to drive change or transformation in this area, if you're trying to have better visibility into your IT um, and software project spend investments, uh, then engage with finance and engage with them early and often, get them on board, the CFO's office, um, your accounting teams, your finance teams, um, they are equal players here. Um, okay, so that's thing one. Thing two, tooling is critical here, right? So it's not just data and it's not just sharing data and visualizing data. Well, I mean, it gets a little, when it comes to visualizing, tooling does become important, but um, there's an engineering component to the data, but there's also a tooling aspect in that you need you need tools that are designed to support the things that we're going to talk about here, right? The right kind of frameworks, the right kind of processes, um, the right kind of metrics that are going to set up the, the fabric of being able to better manage portfolios of technology. Um, uh, you're not going to get an overnight transformation. Um, it takes time and this change is hard. This is hard stuff. Um, and I'm not going to lie about that. It, it's, uh, um, it's as hard as, uh, any type of transformation effort. Um, but it, the, the, the benefits are immense, right? And, uh, there is so much speed, efficiency, cost savings, innovation, cultural improvement, just so many benefits to be had around, uh, around this topic. Um, and then uh, finally, these are some of the key concepts um, that you're going to leverage in order to, to bring this all together in a holistic picture. I'll talk about those a little bit here. All right, so these terms I mentioned, these are the, these are the core terms that are going to kind of define uh, the talking points for the rest of the time here, right? Um, some of these, most of these terms are a little newer, some not. Um, but uh, these are some of the terms that are swirling around. Now, it's important to talk about terms for a little bit because there's a lot of jargon going on here and the vocabulary here is not codified, right? There's, um, there are swirling adjacent ideas and terminology and, and tool sets and people are coming at this from different angles and different folks call it different things. But there is absolutely an emergent trend happening right now around integration of financial visibility and financial management with IT spend. Um, and that can be infrastructure spend, cloud spend, software project spend, agile PMOs and the money they get. But but integrating those with the with the ultimate the CFO function and the in the finance teams that's a that is happening and it's being called different things and these are some of the different things that uh, that refers to it um, so FinOps TBM Cloud Spin ADM and LPM we're gonna I mean I've got a slide on each one of these we're gonna talk a little bit more about it um, now just for fun I did want to mention this one Shadow IT now I haven't heard this term Shadow IT in a while now as much but it used to be a real buzzword like. I don't know, maybe seven, eight, maybe 10 years ago, about the time that the cloud 
was a really big macro trend in, in IT. And so you would hear this term shadow IT all the time. What was shadow IT? Shadow IT was a situation where the official IT department in enterprise organizations um, were beginning to notice that there were things happening related to tech enablement and IT tools, software, computing that were not being managed by the IT department. Um, so this could be things like BYOD or bring on device, you know, people have mobile phones and now they're um, using Outlook on their phones. Now they're, you know, accessing um, tools and workspaces on their phones because why not? Like, obviously people are going to do that on their mobile device. Um, IT sometimes didn't like that. They couldn't apply policy. They couldn't see what was going on. It wasn't a work device. It was a personal device. And so now there, there's a, there's this um, blurring of the lines between conventional IT policy and uh, and usage of devices and data and like personal devices or working with and seeing business data and that that makes um, that makes CIOs and CTOs nervous and for good reason. Uh, but there but with shadow IT there's something else that was starting to go on and this was explicitly about the cloud. Um, and so what was going on was all of a sudden if you knew what you were doing and you had a credit card you could leverage all of these really useful cloud services uh, in a way that wasn't wasn't um, accessible before, right? So let's say if you were on a marketing team or you know sales team or any kind of functional team, product development team, um, especially software project team or something like that. So you got good technical chops. Um, you know, all of a sudden you have access to these really nifty uh, service oriented um, components and, and services and APIs and all this stuff. AWS, just think AWS here. And this was really AWS almost exclusively at first um, until the other cloud providers started to, to try to catch up. Um, but let's say I'm in marketing and uh, I need some kind of computing function and I need some kind of uh, data aggregator or something like that. Well, I could go to my IT team and say, hey, IT team, I really need this. And everybody knows that 10 years ago, enterprise IT teams were totally known for being so accommodating and willing to build new things per business requests. That's that's exactly what IT teams were famous for, right? Um, that's a bit of sarcasm, but so then there was this other choice. I was like, well, I could get my um, my marketing director's credit card, and I could get, and I could set up an AWS account, and I could do this stuff using things right now that are elastic, and I pay as I go, and I don't have to worry about my IT team at all. So that kind of stuff started happening all the time. That was the shadow IT. This was happening all around. So now in a really large, really complicated enterprise environment, you can imagine how many use cases and how many opportunities there are for this kind of thing to happen, right? So over time, um, you've got all of this unsanctioned, unofficial tech compute um, cloud service subscription stuff happening. Um, and that stuff very quickly got you know entangled in critical business processes all around the enterprise. So you couldn't turn it off, um, but then ultimately there were invoices flowing up into finance um, and in aggregate, all of this cloud spend, by the time it gets up to the CFO's office, they're the ones who are sitting in the chair where they can see all of this happening. And they're ultimately they realize, wow, you know, the, there's this provider Amazon, AWS, and, you know, our company is spending millions of dollars on this stuff. And we don't know, no, you know, it, from within finance, we don't know what's what it's for. We don't know what it's doing. We don't know what the value is, et cetera, et cetera. Super uncomfortable position for a CFO to be in, right? Why, why am I signing checks for millions of dollars? Um, Yes, I'm told and I trust my my functional managers that it's important and we can't turn it off, but I, I don't know what I'm paying for here. So so that's a problem, right? So that was basically shadow IT in a nutshell. Now, I think that's worth mentioning because um, that was kind of like the precursor. It was the historical condition that kind of led to, to what we're talking about now. So that's shadow IT. I won't say anything else about that. All right, FinOps. Now, FinOps is a newer thing. Um, these are quotes, I won't read these to you, but essentially kind of what we're talking about here, integration of data, visualization, sharing information, uh, but above all, better, better visibility and financial management of the IT spend. 
Um, often there is a specific specialty around just cloud spend. Um, and you can kind of see why I mentioned the shadow IT thing, because the same dynamic is still at play. Um, but FinOps is this rising thing uh, that has been happening. And uh, it's something where, you know, the finance people, uh, even if they're over there in their silo, they're getting really interested. And, uh, and there's a lot of work coming up. And now there's a, a lot of exciting tools that are coming up to enable this as well. There's a real need. Uh, but then you mentioned this, um, uh, the cultural thing as well. So you see this mentioned here as well, right? But you can you can read this, you will get these slides if you want to. But um, but basically the, the theme is here, we're looking for more visibility, more ability to uh, enact financial controls in a way that doesn't disrupt the, the tech workflow, uh, but we've got to be able to know where we're spending, what we're spending on, and have some idea of the ROI. And for that, you've got to be able to have some shared business understanding, right? Now, there's this other related term uh, that you'll see referred to TBM, technology business management. I'm not really sure that there's much difference between this and FinOps. Um, I'm sure that probably somebody's going to yell at me for saying something like that. But these things are all different approaches on the same idea, right? The idea that um, outsourced IT spend is a critical uh, business uh, um, stream of money that we have to put out. And, uh, but we need to be able to understand where those investments are going, what's the ROI, what are we spending on, et cetera, right? Same, same kind of deal. So you'll see a theme come through here where it's like basically shared flows of data. I mean, they don't say this explicitly on this quote, but if you look at the TBM Council's um, description, comprehensive visibility planning, billing, benchmarking, opt optimization, et cetera, regardless of stack delivery development model. So they're, we're looking at a very tech agnostic type of approach. Um, but how do you think you're going to do this if not with data? So figuring out how to measure is basically what I see them saying here. Um, now, here's another important term, ADM. Um, I put a, uh, I put a uh, definition here from Gartner. Um, but again, like if you look at this, what are we talking about? a business discipline enabled by tech where business and IT work together. Um, you're looking for uniformity, accuracy, stewardship, government, consistency, accountability, et cetera, for data uh, across all of these different tech ecosystems. Um, applica application data is the consistent and uniform set of identifiers, right? So um, just key idea here, right? You When you, we say ADM, we're talking about the um, sort of how how what's another good word for it? It's I don't not sure I like the uniform set of identifiers thing, but you're you're figuring out how to build consistency here across all kinds of data from all kinds of different sources in a way such that you can translate those data sources into business information in both directions from finance to IT, I hope that makes sense. But application data management is, is um, kind of the, the heart of that piece. It's the data governance piece. Um, and then finally, LPM. Um, now I'm gonna spend a few slides on LPM. If you're not familiar with LPM, this is lean portfolio management. So last we see the word portfolio. Um, portfolio is in the title. Um, and for our purposes, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about everything else here and all of the measurement and all the framework that we're using as reference to try to get this working in the context of LPM, because LPM, in my opinion, is the framework that works and it's the most well-developed framework. However, it's funny, if you go and talk to the FinOps people, if you talk to people in finance who are coming at this from their approach and they're interested in, you know, better visibility data flows and, and portfolio management frameworks. A lot of those people have never even heard the term lean portfolio management. Why? Because LPM is an agile type term. It's a, it's a term that's a, um, associated with agile PMOs and agile project management and uh, agile product development and things like that. LPM is um, espoused by SAFE and, and people like that. That's the silo, right? Like that's the development silo. And finance has not been um, integrated with that silo. So that's why I didn't want to put LPM in the title of the webinar because LPM is its own thing and it's been around for quite a while, right? Like, I mean, LPM is not a new thing. 
Uh, but I, what I do think is new is number one, the willingness to collaborate from the people who need a seat at the table, namely finance. Number two, the right tools, uh, tools that are designed to um, bring LPM to life so that instead of just a bunch of ideas and guidance or something you can get a you know, certification for in a two-day class, you get a lot of really good concepts, uh, but how to implement it. My gosh, I mean, it's not an easy thing to implement, especially if you um, don't have the uh, the people you need and they're off over some other silo. Your system isn't built to foster that collaboration and you don't have the tools, you don't have the data access you need, then LPM is just a bunch of theory. But that's starting to change. So a few ideas about LPM. Let's just look at some lean fundamentals before we continue. All right, so lean fundamentals is as simple as it gets. Lean is about value, value first. Where does value come from? Value comes from customers. It comes from users. Uh, it comes from the people who are either, you know, if they're using internal products, there's a value stream there that's created by their work, their labor, their usage of the product is creating the value. If it's customer facing value, that value is money. Customers are giving us dollars to, um, to fuel our business and the dollars are the genesis of that value stream. So value is what it's all about. So you want to find that source of that value and then map the value stream. LPM is all about value streams. And then once you've got identified uh, value streams there, you want to figure out how you optimize those value streams. A stream is literally a stream. It's a flow. It's a time. Um, it's a time dynamic flow of value that's coming through our system um, and we want to we want to optimize that. We do that by relentlessly prioritizing things, and then allowing the people who are the source of the work to pull from that uh, backlog, whether it's at a team level or an enterprise level. There's mechanisms for doing this at, at various tiers of scale. Um, but no matter what, you know, small scale, big scale doesn't matter. It's still all about prioritizing the value, identifying the value, knowing what's valuable. Um, trusting the people doing the work to pull the work um, and then uh, continuously improving, right? So you can take these five basic lean principles and you can look around your system, your teams, your workflow, um, and you can say to yourself, um, do I see these dynamics in play? And if you do, then you're doing something right. And if you don't, then um, then you're not going to be successful with FinOps or LPM or any of these frameworks, right? If you're, if you're even interested in such a thing. So lean fundamentals, back to LPM. Now, when you um, read about LPM or when you go to a class about LPM, you're usually going to see a graphic that looks a little bit about uh, like this, these three triangles. Uh, these three triangles represent sort of the three um, uh, base foundations of LPM. Um, there's, the, there's the funding and the strategy um, as the top of the pyramid. There's portfolio ops. And then there's what we call lean governance. And uh, you can see some of the examples of what these different areas are responsible for. So this is the high level framework uh, around LPM. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to read these to you again, but th these are examples of what these different zones of, of LPM baselines are responsible for. And you can see some of the things that they, they do. So obviously, um, over here on the left, this is just kind of like practical um, <laughs> considerations of LPM. What, why would we adopt LPM? Why would we try to structure our PMO this way? Why would we try to um, manage our all of our projects and portfolios this way? This is why the LPM is essentially a, a, an at-scale organizational framework for basically doing a lot of the same things that, that small A Agile um, or if you want to call it agile or call it something else, call it lean uh, IT management or, you know, call it doing things the smart way, people first, value first, whatever you want to call it, doing things like that at the team level, LPM is a framework for doing, achieving those same types of outcomes, but at a corporate or organizational level. We're still trying to do a lot of the same things, right? Learn quick, adapt quick, be responsive. Focus on value, deliver that value quickly in small increments, shrink the cycle time, work feedback into the system so you can learn lessons and improve and pivot and adapt. Um, a shared vision, a shared understanding of what the value goals and strategy are. Um, focusing on the outcomes, value-based outcomes over outputs. 
um, orienting our work around streams of value, business value, um, not organizing everything around projects. Um, now, I've been on a real kick here where I'm really getting tired of hearing people get down on on projects and project management. Um, I think that there's like some baby being thrown out with the bathwater there. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I get it. I do not think that you know conventional phase gated or waterfall style project management should be the defining character of the of the way that the work is managed. Um, but in terms of like project management and some project stuff, like we need some of that stuff. Okay. Like let's get real. Um, it's not about choosing, um, you know, like a place to plant a flag. Oh, I'm agile. Oh no, I'm project management. Oh no, I'm, this is product. Product is my thing. You know, you can, it doesn't, you don't have to, um, choose exclusively. You need to have all the tools available to you. Look, the work we have to do is really intense and it's complex. You don't want to, you don't want to like block off any particular um, area of enterprise toolkit. So, you know, pr there's going to be some project stuff. There's going to be some project management stuff. There's going to be some product development stuff. Um, but LPM gives you a framework for all these things which organizes it around the value stream. Um, and the value stream is the is the ultimate organizing principle. And then just like at the team level, cross-functional teams, we need them to be engaged and deliver all the way through the system. So that's, that's um, kind of my spiegel and LPM. These are the nine principles of LPM according to IC Agile. I, I like these principles pretty good. You'll see it's a, it's a lot of the same themes, right? Customers first. Um, adaptation, you got to be able to have transparency and, and alignment around the vision, the goals and strategy. Um, everything's or organized around value streams, um, shorten the cycles, uh, open up the flow, reduce waste, um, pull based system based on demand, um, demand of work, things like that, right? So those are those are just I'm throwing a lot of principles at you, but LPM is the underlying thing. Now, when we, if we're going to apply LPM as the framework, to be able to actually govern IT spending, um, software product investments, and and things like that, uh, then there are some questions here that have to be answered. Um, and so th these are just just me spitballing. These are some of the ones that um, that I feel like are quite obvious, right? And now I don't have. There's no one right answer to these questions. The, there are one right question <laughs> that you should ask if you're going to implement this thing, kind of thing. But if you're talking about if you're talking about um, shortening your budget cycle or integrating more um, with an LPM type framework, then there's some financial questions you have to answer, right? So what is what is value, right? Um, if you're if you're going to tie funding to what we're saying, delivery of business value, what even is that? And is everybody on the same page about that? And if people can't communicate that and have it be the same, then you're like, you're not even out of the gate, right? You have to have a common vision, a common idea of this, and you've got to be able to communicate it. Now, once you have that and you've come up with like OKRs and KPIs, OKRs and KPIs are a key part of the mix, but that's not a way to manage the, the teams. So you have to have a whole different rubric for team management, but this is a big mistake people make. So like once they come up with the KPIs and OKRs, um, they're they're trying to manage their teams to that, and now you just have another top down, um, non lean way of trying to manage things. Where does business value come from? What does it mean? Well, how do we define value? Do we have a, the same shared vision? Um, have we identified our value streams? Do we understand the mechanics of how value is flowing through the system? Um, and have we established flow? Um, do we have service level agreements? Are we using enterprise level Kanban, just like we might use Kanban at a team level or something like that? So lot, lots of questions here. Um, now, bringing it back to the IT spending side and the metrics. Um, this is kind of what we're looking at at the moment. Um, 2024, I'm going to take a breath, doing a lot of talking. I want to look at the chat here real quick. Thank you, Laura, for posting the LPM class. Uh, we do offer that. Um, thank you, Danny. I am glad to be in good company. You're good company here. Um, I just, I don't know. I've just really realized lately, like project management bashing is so <laughs> anti, um, 
Um, we have a question in the chat. What is VUCA? VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and what's the A for? Laura, can you help me out? Somebody. Ambiguity. What was it? Ambiguity. Ambiguity. Yes. Thank you. So VUCA is an acronym um, that basically means things are changing all the time. There's a lot of unknown unknowns. We don't know what's going to hit us in the forehead tomorrow. Um, and if we are doing all of our work based on plan driven, long cycle time, predictive frameworks um, is a recipe for disaster. Um, so that's what VUCA means. Uh, we have another question. What about OPEX and CAPEX? We're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Okay, so this is what we're looking at a lot of time. Um, has finance had a seat at the table when we're talking about PPM, um, project management, executing on agile projects, um, how we run things in the PMO, how we run things in the LACE, our center of excellence? Um, do we have do we have high level business stakeholders who come from finance represented there? Yes or no? That's the question. Um, I'm going to assume that in most cases, the answer is no. Um, in most cases, it seems like it's no. So if we have an agile center of excellence, or if we have an agile PMO, or if we're well underway with a, with a safe transformation, or, or an agile transformation, or um, a digital transformation, any of these things, and you know we're making progress. Our works by sprints. You know we're empowering the team. We're we're set up in cross functional roles. Um, you know we're doing all this. We can make efforts like this for years. But when you step back and look, we're still using essentially a baseline annual budget. Um, our main purse string holders are still in a silo over here somewhere. Are they helping with the product decisions? Do they understand what we're building? Do they have assurance that we're building the right thing? Um, are they involved in product discovery? Um, usually not. Okay, so that's a big challenge. Um, now let's think about it from the CFO's point of view for a minute. Now, and I'm sure that on this group, we've encountered some of this stuff. What, what a lot of times do senior financial decision makers hear when they think about agile transformations? Um, oh, well, well, we can't, um, we can't estimate that. Um, forecasting goes out the window. We're going to self-organize. Um, we're going to measure things in dog points or t-shirt sizing. It's relative estimating, right? Relative estimate. We're not going to estimate in units of time or units of money. Um, we're going to figure it out as we go. We, we can't really tell you when it'll be done. Um, not saying that's every agile practice, but these are absolutely things that come up. Now, if you are, if you are CFO, you can imagine what that it's going to be like nails on a chalkboard to hear that stuff. Um, and furthermore, you cannot blame them. They, they've got a business to run, right? Like at the end of the day, no matter how much progress you make with the, with the agile transformation, um, and no matter how effective those types of practices and ceremonies and, and sort of like measurement techniques are for an agile team or even uh, a release train or even like a team of teams or, or a large scale agile framework, um, no matter how well those things work, if, they, if you cannot get the stuff translated into the financial statement for the CFO's office, the cycle is not complete, right? The digital transformation has not happened in a meaningful way. Uh, because ultimately, somebody in finance is going to be trying to force the same old metrics, the same old financial management um, onto the transformative work patterns, no matter how far they've come, right? So here, these are now I'm just going to start finding a bunch of examples of stuff at you. Because again, as I said, um, there's no one size fits all here. You just need to understand what's possible. So what's possible, right? CFOs need to understand the money. So uh, we want to be able to convert the types of metrics that we use on agile teams into dollars, right? But for example, right, you can, if you're using story points, capacity, burn down, cadence, um, all these things are things that with a little bit of work, we can figure out how to translate those things into, into financial terms. 
Um, we ordinarily just don't because a lot of times that's not there's not a call for it from financial interoperation. Well, what we want to do here is absolutely interoperate with finance. So you got to work together with finance on these things, right? It's going to take some work to, to make these translations. But if you think about what's being spent um, for the work effort, there's already a lot of work done there in the agile practice. And you just take it a step further to translate it into monetary terms. Um, financial stakeholders need to understand ROI. So we have to design financial metrics for, for the ROI of the, the projects or the, uh, the agile work or um, the overhead or you know the the opex when it comes to um, the agile team capacity and all, all of this is resting on kind of an assumption that you've got healthy sustained teams they've established some cadence um, you know they've got their their capacity is uh, kind of figured out and stable so that you can begin to attribute financial terms to some of these things so you know it's not there's a certain evolutionary path that has to happen here um, value streams, how do we how do we assign monetary value and data points to that? I mean, then finally, dashboards um, for any of these metrics. And there's a couple of um, uh, examples here where we might translate some of the agile metrics into more traditional financial metrics and KPIs. Um, but uh, but there's all kinds of metrics that you could consider here. So those that's just a little bit about um what we want to turn into dollars and cents financial terms for our CFO and our finance department. Where do we get the data for this? Now, this is where things kind of start to get exciting because there's a lot happening right now. Um, and there's a lot of emergent trends of just over like the last two years or so. They're really starting to hit the mainstream a little bit. Um, but the thing that makes this work, as I said at the very beginning, is the ability to, to capture aggregate and parse and make sense and visualize of data from all kinds of sources. Where can it come from? So we're going to need data from the finance side of the house or that's close to the, that side of the house. Could be sales data from anywhere. Um, you know, it could be um, uh, ERP data. Um, all of these stores of data are going to play a role. But then we're also going to need data that's specifically associated with um, the execution of our, our IT teams and our, our software product teams as they do their work, build the products, um, spend on the cloud services, things like that. And all of that stuff should be available somewhere. It might be available in ADO. It might be available in JIRA. Um, it might be available through your, uh, your cloud reporting or whatever. But the, the point here is it really doesn't matter, right? Um, this thing is all bound together in whatever your FinOps tooling platform uh, is, and I'm going to talk more about tooling platforms before we end, but um, I think the point I want to make is that in just the last couple of years, we're really starting to see platforms that are built to do this. And so you probably, I mean, if you were smart and really driven and you know, you're really good executive sponsors, you probably could have done this FinOps thing a few years ago. It's not like you couldn't have, but all of a sudden the barrier to entry has just been lowered because there's tooling, um, tooling companies have realized oh, LPM is a better way to manage our, our vast portfolios of, of huge overhead and super expensive technology projects um, rather than the, the more waterfallish ways that we've done this. And so, um, but realizing the need for the data and the data visualization and the metrics, now they've built platforms for that. So, so that is a game changer. So that's where data comes from. Now let's think about where money comes from. Where does the funding come from? It can come from all kinds of places, right? Now, if we are assuming um, a moderately mature uh, organization who has adopted some agility practices at some degree of scale, uh, again, call it what you will, but let's say that we're, we're kind of following the principles of the Agile Manifesto. And we're kind of following some of the framework principles um, of one of the one of the at scale frameworks that's out there. We don't have to have adopted an explicitly named framework. You just have to have some of the ideas going, right? So, but there, these are some of the ways that this can happen. So we've got funding at the portfolio level. We've got workflows that have budgets approved. Um, you've got a bunch of people financials here. So again, hitting on the OPEX angle just a little bit. Um, in, in an agile at scale organization, you know, we've got that organized by value streams down through our trains and our arts all the way down to the team levels. All of these things have overhead and budget approved. So there's all kinds of sources of money um, that are there to be measured. And there's all kinds of 
um, you know, tracking for this stuff. And, and there's systems that we can reach into and see these data points, right? So that's kind of one of the first steps is understanding where can we find the data? Uh, where do we find the financial information that we need uh, to bring into the FinOps system and translate that into financial metrics that gives somebody who's a financial stakeholder visibility into uh, what's going on with the IT spend. So, and it might not look like this for you, but uh, the point is there's budget approval all over the place. You need data that you can look at and begin to weave these things together. So how do we do this? How do we integrate financial system data with IT spending and start start to uh, be able to paint a holistic picture of this um, in a way that we don't have to wait a year to do a big review. It's in more real time, or it's at least in a smaller uh, increment of time so that we uh, uh, we can see it faster. Um, we're, we're seeing it before all the money is spent on the wrong thing, et cetera. Again, just some examples here. Um, you can uh, reach into tools like ADO and JIRA, as I mentioned, your IT project management tools, um, aggregate that with data from the finance department, from the, the ERP or whatever. Um, and the tooling platform is where this comes together. You can, you can start to chart this stuff. So you can start to quantify um, at, a, at a monetary level, at a metric level, and at a dashboard level, the principles of something like LPM uh, but now you've actually got real, real team performance data, real project data, and real financial data that you can begin to associate with those principles. Um, so these are just a few examples, right? Um, you know, work logging, all the things that are in JIRA, um, purchases, things like that. Your FinOps tooling will aggregate this stuff and you can um, configure it so that you've actually got a live feed of IT spin. Now, just, just that level of data sharing alone um, has the potential to be a game changer for IT stakeholders just because they can see where the money's going. Um, and for a lot of uh, a lot of IT stakeholders, or I'm sorry, finance stakeholders, uh, that might be a new thing. A couple other examples here, categorize spending, tag that stuff, tag it by expenses so that you can categorize all of the IT stuff that's happening. Again, relies on the tooling platform, roll that up. Now all of a sudden you've got lots of metrics and dashboards you can look at. A couple other examples, um, budget versus actuals, nothing could be more basic, but when you take the budget versus actual uh, approach and then you apply that to um, you know what's being burned down. Um, finance people love that data. You know that can be the burn down of the agile team. Um, it can be the burn down of uh, the the budget. Um, whatever you're spending on, spending on tooling, um, tools, expenses, overhead, people, whatever. And then uh, finally, forecasting and trends. Um, been traditionally very difficult uh, with IT, but with the tooling, this is made possible. So just a handful of examples there. All right, so let's think about the metrics and let's kick those up to the dashboards. At the end of the day, this will only work if you can visualize everything um, and uh, you need to be collaborating between IT and finance and everybody looking at the same dashboard. And that's kind of going to create the conditions for this to happen. Dashboards aren't going to make it happen, but um, the dashboards create the conditions so that this elasticity and flexibility can happen. Um, so this is just another, I'm going to have another list of examples here, right? Um, I won't go through every single point here. You will get these slides, but these are some critical dashboards that at least some of these should be included in the, in the uh, FinOps mix. Um, and you can, again, just thinking about pulling data from all the places, all the IT project management, all the ticketing, all the, all the service management, uh, all the ERP data sources, sales sources, all the CRM sources, all the sources that you have, the FinOps platforms are, are built to grab data from all those things. So if you think about all of those data sources being available to you, you can start to think about how you might build some of these things, right? So you can build dashboards on all of these. Um, how, uh, what's, what's actually the state and the, the tooling and the expenditures in IT? Um, how well are my tools integrating? Can I measure compliance and controls and, and traceability from an IT uh, standpoint? Um, how's my engagement? You know, how's my sentiment analysis from the from the stakeholders? All of this is very valuable data to be able to visualize. One more slide here with examples. Um, we're really getting into the nuts and bolts here. Budget and ROI dashboard. 
Um, we need to be able to build things like this. These are the things that our financial stakeholders are going to be looking for. These are the data points. These are the metrics, right? So um, aggregating the data from the sources, uh, we need to be able to measure these things. Now, when we get into um, the actual framework of something like LPM, this is really where the, the, the magic happens, but it also takes some work and it takes some creativity. Um, it takes cross-functional stakeholders coming together to design what does this look like? How can we measure our value streams in monetary terms? How can we see the flow of that? Can we detect our bottlenecks and wastes? Um, there are tool products that are available whose sole purpose is just to plug into your JIRA environment and identify bottlenecks. Um, and that's really not that hard to do, but it's tremendously valuable once you've done it. And once you identify a bottleneck, of course, you can work on that, expand that bottleneck, that expands flow through the system. Now we're starting to manage IT workflow in, in a slightly more lean way. Um, let's see here. Where was I? Ah, yes, incremental funding. I uh, mentioned this at the top. Um, agile budgeting, incremental funding. Now, I think the point here is one, once you start to establish this vis visibility and the data is being pulled and visualized in real time, now one of the biggest hurdles to that, to, to uh, budgeting faster than that annual cycle that you've already ha always had, um, which is just like all of the homework that has to be done, all the review, all of the analysis that has to be done, um, you're saving, completely cutting away so much of that time because now um, the teams are staying informed about that stuff with these data flows. So you see why I'm really harping on like the data flows because that's what's crucial to this. Uh, final example here, uh, portfolio performance. Um, just some examples of what you can see here, right? Like resource allocation, capacity management is a big one in FinOps. It's something that financial stakeholders tear their hair out over because that is a big source of expenditure um, and they don't always know, you know, that, oh, this is like, you know, um, fixed cost stuff and what am I getting for that? Um, so we've got to be able to translate that into portfolio terms uh, in alignment with the strategy. If we think back and go back here to the, the LPM slide real quick, this is kind of why they've organized LPM into these three different main areas, right? Because you've got to have You've got to have um, executive and leadership sponsors um, who can see the work and they're responsible for maintaining, communicating the vision um, and owning that portfolio flow. So, so uh, the strategic funding is a, is a specific zone of LPM that's responsible for coordinating and owning that flow and, and doing the funding. Um, as I heard uh, Shane Hasty say recently, keep, keep the bank open year round. Don't just, don't just open the bank once a year. Okay, so those are dashboard examples. So we've got metric examples, dashboard examples. Let's actually look at some of these. Now, um, this is just a, a quick set of snapshots of what this looks like in action. Um, the tool that these screen grabs are uh, drawn from is uh, a tool called Aptio Target Process. I don't know if you're familiar with Aptio, but um, I'm, not, I'm not affiliated with Aptio um, and I'm not here to endorse them. It's just the tool that I'm most familiar with because of my experience. Um, but I should say that like Aptio is going hard on this exact idea. They, they have built this platform explicitly to enable these types of practices. And they were acquired, uh, it was last year or the year before, uh, Aptio was acquired by IBM. So Aptio Target Process and Aptio One, and there's a there's a whole subset of tools around Aptio. Um, but Aptio is the FinOps tool tooling platform and data aggregator that that can do all this with, I should say, with relative ease. Um, you might it it's not as hard as you might think to to aggregate data from Jira, the CRM, um, the ERP, and all these data sources from wherever, right? Like you can, you, you've got all the data you need and you can aggregate it all and you can visualize it beautifully with a tool like Aptio. So, so you can see these are like some financial planning and performance dashboards that are all being fed by the performance of the IT teams. Um, and these are gonna be of great interest to financial stakeholders. Um, so just a sample of financial planning and performance dashboards. Another couple of real world dashboards here. And now we're getting into the actual um, at scale agile implementation, the, the LPM implementation. So you've got dashboards fed by actual data points um, from the IT teams, from the development practice um, around intake, kickoff, project discovery, 
Um, moving on down the line, um, here we're prioritizing the backlog, maintaining all the work here. The difference is we're not just walled off to the to the agile practice using this for, to manage our agile workflow. Now this is this is um, integrated and in sync with funding, investments, budgets, um, and above all, collaboration with our financial stakeholders. So now everybody's seeing the same thing. And this is how transformation happens, breaking down the silos and getting people talking in the, the common language of data so they have the same understanding of the, of, the, of the budgets, the dollars, what the value is, all these things that I talked about at the beginning. Um, more dashboards, now we're getting more into it, more at scale production level workflows. Um, but, uh, you know, dashboards and, and uh, uh, aggregation of data like this kind of starts to tie it all together. Like this is the kind of report that a financial stakeholder and a PMO director both is going to be equally vested in, in examining and analyzing, right? They're going to be able to see a holistic picture of the spending mix. Did our, was our product discovery right? Did we build the right thing? Did we invest in the right thing? Um, how's the value measured? You know, what's the ROI? We can measure all these things like this. I hope this makes sense. Um, and then finally, I think I'm getting to the end. I hope so, because I don't have two minutes left. Um, I mentioned Aptio, but I just wanted to give you a quick look. Um, this is from Gartner. Um, there are other tools that can do this, um, that can implement LPM and integrate these things with financial metrics. Um, but all, all of these providers have tools here, and here's a list of them that you know, if you want to refer back to these, you can. Um, but uh, I will plug Aptio again. Just I, I have a bias towards them because it's the one I'm familiar with. But uh, um, but there are uh, tool sets that are, um, again, explicitly designed to, to aggregate and bring the FinOps and the data points and the aggregation and the LPM principles, all bringing this all to life from a point where the rubber really hits the road. It's not just theory. So there's a, just a a quick list of other tools. All right, in sum, talk about the main things at the beginning. These are my main things at the end. Um, just a few quick points here. Uh, at first, you wanna be able to target portfolios of work that you know the change and the capacity, the work capacity for making that change happen can get baked into the sprint or the, the backlog. Um, uh, the capacity. Uh, you've got to be able to do that so you can get some quick wins. You're not going to change everything overnight, right? Um, also, you know, what work you're doing to drive this change, you have to have capacity for that work. That work is work just like all the other project work. So um, you can't just task somebody with being a change agent or, or you know, enacting some kind of transformation. And, um, you know, that stuff's got to be budgeted, paid for just like everything else. Um, and, and then as you keep saying, um, I know it sounds squidgy, but culture and breaking down the silos between the stakeholders um, is absolutely essential. It's not going to work if you can't do that. Um, and then probably probably should have put this um, penultimate point at the top, actually. But data governance and data provenance as a first class requirement is absolutely essential. Um, if you don't have well-governed data and the data is accurate, then um, none of this works, right? And then similarly with the people. Uh, so... Um, you hear it all the time, people, process, technology. Um, it's a cliche, but it's true. Uh, but in this case, the thing that really, really makes it work is the, the data and the ability to aggregate and visualize it. Um, and that's it. So I know that was a lot. Um, I will hang here on the Zoom for like five minutes. Um, I know we didn't get a lot of time for Q&A, but I hope that the information was useful. Um, and uh, I'll just, I'll hang here if anybody wants to chat or ask me questions. I'm, I'm happy to, to hang back for about five minutes. And Laura, with that, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you, Chris. This has been so informative. I hope you guys took away something that's useful in your day-to-day -day jobs. And if you are interested in learning more, please do reach out to us. So we're happy to point you in the right direction in terms of any future webinars that we have coming up or a future course that we'll be running. All of our courses are live and online. Well, they're not all online, but they're all live. So we really pride ourselves in our interactive courses that uh, span many topics. As we mentioned, Lean Portfolio Management is just one of them. Chris has an awesome generative AI for project management course coming up. Just getting rave reviews on that one. Um, great topic there. If you haven't explored generative AI for your job, that's a great way to get really practical, hands-on 
information, tips and tricks to really make your time better spent day to day. Um, please feel free to reach out. I put the email in the chat. We have a number of good courses on the calendar coming up. Always open to your feedback and questions. And as I mentioned, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn as well. We're open to your connections there as well. Um, I'll just check the chat. If, if there's anyone that had a question, it looks like, Chris, there's a couple here. Business value is absolute value in dollars, while story point is a relative value. There must be some time spent on matching these two in unit while the be beginning of an LPM. Uh, yeah, if the question is just, can I confirm that that's correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah, business value is about um, money. Um, story points are relative value of effort. So we've got to be able to spend some time designing what what is the translation, um, you know, whether it's a story point or something like that, you know, or what what any other like practical um, construct that we use on an agile team or in an agile portfolio to measure work, measure velocity, um, measure effort, you know, it, all, all of the things that we use in Agile to, to help us get the work done in a way that we, we know with confidence we are going to achieve the business value, we're going to solve the problem, we just don't always know exactly how yet. Um, but uh, all of those things that we use, um, yes, got to spend some time translating those into, into absolute value. Um, and then agreeing on the data, um, what the metrics going to be from the data, and then how will we visualize the metrics. Yeah, so 100%. Thanks, Chris. Well, with that, I'll just give you one more reminder. Keep an eye on your inbox. I've got an email coming to you with your PDU code. And then after about a day, I'll send you another one with the recording and the slides. So thanks, everyone, for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your day.